I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our event today, which features a conversation with Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman. Before I uh, begin today's event, I want to remind you that we have another exciting schedule of speakers this semester, and that includes a distinguished lecture series that's looking at the current crisis in, in American constitutional democracy. The first lecture in that series was given by the Pulitzer Prize winning author uh, Eric Foner last week. And if you miss that event, you can still catch it on our YouTube station. Our next uh, lecture in that series will be given this Thursday, February 25th at noon by the renowned constitutional scholar, Bruce Ackerman. He's the Sterling Professor of Law at, the, at Yale University. And uh, I encourage you to join us then uh, to listen to that lecture. As always, you can learn more about our upcoming events and other Foley programs by subscribing to our, our YouTube station, liking us on Facebook, or emailing us at tsfoley at wsu.edu. So compared to other uh, recent elections, 2020 was not particularly close. Joe Biden won the presidency by more than 7 million votes and an electoral college margin of 306 to 232. Here in Washington, Governor Jay Inslee won re his reelection challenge against Republican candidate Lauren Culp by more than 13 percentage points. Yet 2020 will go down as one of the most contested and controversial elections in history. Donald Trump refused to concede and continues to claim without evidence that the election was stolen as a result of widespread voter fraud. The Trump campaign lost over 60 court cases, many before judges he himself appointed challenging the election. And the president's claims were rejected by his own Department of Justice and his top election security official at the Department of Homeland Security, who declared 2020, quote, the most secure election in American history, end quote. Here in the state of Washington, despite losing by more than half a million votes, Lauren Culp also refused to concede. He attacked state and local election officials and sued the Secretary of State, claiming there had been intolerable voting anomalies in the election that was at all times fraudulent. However, Mr. Culp eventually withdrew his lawsuit after the state threatened to countersue and asked the court to impose sanctions for filing a frivolous lawsuit. Despite all evidence to the contrary, a Quinnipiac poll just last week found that 36% of Americans and 76% of all Republicans still believe there was widespread election fraud in 2020. So what are the facts and why are so many Americans confused? Should Americans have confidence in the integrity of our elections? And what are we going or what are we doing here in the state of Washington to reassure voters that our elections are free, fair and secure? We are fortunate to have with us today the perfect person to, dis that, to discuss these issues. Kim Wyman is Washington's 15th Secretary of State. She was first elected to her office in, in 2012 and was reelected to a third term last year. She is just a second woman to hold this position and now has the distinction of being the only statewide elected Republican in the state of Washington. In fact, the only statewide elected Republican on the entire West Coast. As Secretary of State, Kim is responsible for overseeing all elections in Washington, as well as overseeing the state library and state archives. Under Kim's leadership, Washington has become a national leader in election innovation, election administration, and cybersecurity practices. She appeared frequently in national media last year to discuss election security measures. Prior to becoming Secretary of State, Kim served 12 years as Thurston County Auditor. She received a BA from the University of California at Long Beach and holds a master's degree from Troy State University. On a personal note, I also want to add that Kim is a great friend and supporter of the Foley Institute. Each year we co-host an event with her office at the state capitol during the legislative session. Of course, this year we can't do that because of the pandemic. So I really appreciate Kim taking time out of her busy schedule to be with us today via Zoom. Secretary Wyman is gonna speak for about uh, 20 to 30 minutes after which we'll have plenty of time for discussion. If you have questions, I encourage you to send those to me at tsfoley at wsu.edu. Again, that's tsfoley as in Thomas Foley at wsu.edu. So Kim, I'm gonna turn the time over to you now and I'll be back after your presentation with some questions from our audience. 
Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Cornell. And it is truly an honor to be here. I'm a little disappointed that we can't do it in person here on the Capitol campus like we normally do, where we have uh, interns and uh, a number of students that are working on, during session. And uh, it's disappointing to not be able to fill a room in the way we normally do. But I hope that uh, in the next hour, we can really dig, it, dig deep into what happened in 2020 related to election security and why you should have confidence that our election was fair, accurate, and um, uh, well run. And so I'm going to go to a slideshow right now. Bear with me for a moment. Um, hopefully. There we go. So uh, I want to begin by starting with what were you thinking about and worrying about a year ago? And when you think back to a year ago, it feels like, I don't know for you, but for me, it feels like it was a decade ago. But what I was worried about as the state's chief election officer really was uh, foreign interference in our elections and overcoming misinformation and disinformation from those foreign actors like Russia and Iran and China, because that's what we had really been fighting and battling uh, in the four years leading into the 2020 election. And then, of course, <laughs> that wasn't enough to worry about cybersecurity and running a presidential election in a very high profile year. 2020 brought all sorts of additional challenges to election officials, uh, a global pandemic, civil unrest, a reorganization of the Postal Service, misinformation and disinformation campaigns from right here at home, a deep partisan divide, a hurricanes, and it also just threw in a couple wildfires because, you know, why not? Hashtag 2020. So, um, the year progressed and, and we could spend an hour talking just about what happened in 2020, but in the aftermath of the election, uh, Cornell really hit on what happened here in Washington and happened nationally. Uh, we had candidates and campaigns who started making pretty robust, in my opinion, baseless and oftentimes um, misleading and not factual uh, com uh, complaints of rampant voter fraud. We counted more votes and were registered uh, voters. We had illegal voting. And this was happening across multiple platforms. It was uh, happening on social media by the candidates and campaigns themselves. Uh, it was happening by the president of the United States, certainly. And of course, media across the country were picking up those tweets and those uh, allegations and they became front page headlines. So when we look at uh, 2020 in the rearview mirror, this, this sums up how I felt at the end of it. Um, but uh, what I wanna do today is really talk and focus in on election security, because what I found is the best way to um, combat all of the misinformation that has been spread about elections in, uh, in the United States and here in Washington state is to talk about the facts. And the strengths of our election system are, are multi-layered and intertwined from a decentralized system and the way here in Washington, we do a good job of balancing access and security to the way we manage our data and provide both physical and cybersecurity. So that's what we're gonna talk about in the next 20 minutes or so. So let me start sort of big picture with the United States. And one of the strengths and kind of at times a weakness of the US election system is that it's very decentralized. And what I mean by that is that the election officials who are in charge of counting votes and overseeing the systems um, are at the state and local level. And we have over 10,000 election officials like myself who are either appointed or um, elected who are in charge of um, their elections at a state level, a county level, and in sometimes a township or, or local city level. And each of these election officials takes an oath of office, they're sworn in, and they take an oath to uphold the constitution and the constitution and laws of the state that they operate in. And the strength of the system ultimately is that no single person or group has control or power to influence the election. And that's also true here in Washington state. Uh, Washington state, I am the chief election officer for the state of Washington, and I'll talk about my office's responsibilities in a moment. But in the counties, in each of the 39 counties, there's an election official 
38 of the counties, it's the county auditor. And in King County, it is the election director. And these officials are all elected by their county uh, constituency. And they're responsible for uh, running and managing their own elections. So printing ballots and uh, making sure they get to the right voter and have the right information on them. Uh, overseeing the tabulation system that counts those ballots and uh, managing the the day-to-day -day data so the the voter registration rolls and uh, and and making sure that they're doing good voter outreach to their voters in their county here in Washington state the office of the Secretary of State is responsible for a number of those functions on a state level uh, we manage the vote law system which I'll talk about a little later in this presentation uh, we have an election security operations center which I'll also talk about in a moment. But probably the most significant thing that we oversee is the rulemaking authority or the Washington Administrative Code for election law. So whenever the, the uh, governor signs a bill into law related to elections, any of the details of how that, that law is going to be enacted fall in the administrative code section of the um, uh, of rulemaking. And our office is the one that's responsible for writing that, those rules. We also oversee the statewide initiative and referendum process, and we certify and train election officials in the 39 counties. Uh, and finally, we certify election tabulation systems, which these are the systems that count the ballots that ultimately are um, part of each election. So I wanna now start with kind of why I think Washington state system is so solid and why you should have the the um, confidence in the results that we see in any given election and it's because i think our state does a really remarkable job of balancing access to voting and voter registration with security measures that that make the system work so everyone can believe that it's fair and that it's accurate and um, on the promoting access side our state has a long history of being kind of on the front edge of innovative ideas like absentee ballots that anyone could request and be a permanent absentee voter to vote by mail elections. And particularly in the last uh, two years, um, the legislature has put a focus on access to democracy and in 2018 passed some pretty sweeping legislation that made our election system and voter registration incredibly accessible with same day voter registration, automatic voter registration, uh, future voter program for 16 and 17 year olds and the Washington Voting Rights Act. And, and as you can see on this slide, other things that have been innovations include the Native American Voting Rights Act, uh, paying for return postage for those ballots and uh, student engagement hubs, which of course WSU was an active participant in and uh, universal voter registration. And so when you look at all of these laws that have been passed, particularly in the last two years, um, the Washington State Legislature has really put uh, voting rights front and center and making sure that, that our voting system is really accessible. So to balance that out, election officials in, in the last really, quite frankly, in my tw almost 30 years of doing this work have really focused on having the compensating security measures in place so that when somebody criticizes something like same day registration, we can show that that process is secure and that even if a voter receives more than one ballot, they're only going to have one counted. So this is multiple layers of security and it really starts with um, some of the technology that we've uh, developed over the last you know, 12 years or so, uh, like the Electronic Registration Information Center or ERIC. This is a data matching center for voter registration that helps us keep our rolls clean to a statewide voter registration system called VoteWA, which really allows counties to talk to each other in real time and uh, strengthening our cybersecurity uh, posture in the area of elections. And so that's really what we're going to dive into here now. Let me begin by talking about ERIC. Um, when, when we started looking at a national level in 2008 at voter registration, what the Pew Research Center found is that one in eight voter registration records across the country had an error in them. It was either a typo in someone's name or an address that maybe had the wrong number, but there were one in eight 
registrations had errors. And this is incredibly problematic because it makes it difficult to get voters the right information, to get ballots to them, to put them in the right precinct for voting purposes. So we began a process and Washington State was an active participant in this in creating a project called ERIC, uh, the Electronic Registration Voting or Information Center. And what ERIC is, is it's a, a data matching center that now 31 states participate in. And we, we put our data in from our voter registration systems. It is one way hashed and your personal data is not shared with the other states, but in this data matching center, it's compared and that information goes back to the states so that we can find duplicate registrations when a voter you know, is registered in Washington and moves to say Colorado to uh, people who have passed away and are no longer um, living so they can't vote um, to uh, just interstate moves. And so um, this system has really been a game changer here in Washington state. We went live with Eric in 2012. And um, what you see on these two, these two sets of numbers on the bar graphs is by category of transactions that we deal with since 2012, the number of um, people who have died and that we've removed from the rolls because of Eric. Uh, so over 22,000 people in that period of time, in those eight years have been removed from the rolls in Washington state. And the numbers in green and parentheses is the number of transactions we made in each category in 2020. So you can see that, that the activity that county auditors are doing on our vote law system is pretty robust in just trying to keep the voter registration records up to date. Um, so we've removed a, a number of people, uh, 32,000 people for in-state duplicates. So they were registered in more than one county or had more than one registration on the rolls. And particularly when you look at uh, in that far right column in state updates, these are address changes predominantly. So realize that 10% of our population moves each year. So in the eight years that we've had um, uh, Eric up and running, we've been able to identify over 800,000 people who have changed their address and update those addresses with, with the voters consent and get them the right information on election day. And then as you can also see, we have a large number of people who move out of state. So, um, so Eric has really uh, revolutionized our um, election system here in Washington and really across the country. Then the next thing I'm really proud to share with you is the vote law system. And so this really was a remarkable partnership of the 39 county auditors offices and election divisions and the secretary of state's office. And we built a statewide voter registration system and election management system that combined 39 separate election management systems that each county were, was using and two statewide voter registration systems into a single um, system. And this was happening between about 2015 and 2019. And our real goal was to get it up and live in 2019 because of those laws I talked about in 2018 that the legislature passed. Um, the only way we could effectively build in the security measures for same day registration, for example, was to give the auditors the ability to talk to each other in real time um, to, to make sure that you know, Cornell Clayton is only registered to vote in one county and not in, uh, in Spokane and in um, King County, for example. So um, this system went live in 2019 and we've now used it successfully in seven elections. And it was a game changer in 2012. It was really quite honestly, the only reason we were able to pull off the 2020 election so successfully because we had that interconnectivity of the, um, of the built law system. Now, as we were building this, we really had an eye also to security. And this really predates 2016 because um, what we knew was the system that we had was vulnerable because it was old and we needed to make sure we had multiple layers of firewalls and that um, we were encrypting the, the personal information of all of our voter registration files and we still needed the public to be able to get to information. So when, when we built this system, we were able to put in simple things now, they were revolutionary a few years ago, but simple now, uh, multi-factor authentication for each one of our users 
officers across the 39 counties. And in 2020, we had over 3,000 people who were on the vote law system in counties working, you know, processing ballots and things on election morning. And um, the system was secure and it worked. So we're really proud of that. And then we also um, built in layered security so we could have that public interface but the public couldn't actually get to our main database. And I could probably go into a lot of detail about the um, technical security layers of this, but uh, um, I'm not that good. So I'm gonna just skip over, but, but know that we did build in all of this security in the original design of Vote Wah. And then 2016 happened. Um, 2016, we know that um, uh, in July of 2016, we started to detect um, activity that we suspected here in Washington and in my office suspected was foreign actors trying to get into our um, old system. Uh, we were able to effectively block their IP addresses. We contacted the FBI and Department of Homeland Security and we monitored that activity and we were very confident that they did not get into our system. But turns out we were uh, not the only one that this was happening to across the country. And uh, in the, the height of the 2016 election, uh, the Department of Homeland Security Director uh, Jay Johnson designated elections as critical infrastructure. And what this means is, is that the sec national security of our election system is as important as the power grid or the banking system. But what it really meant for us was it gave us resources and access to resources that we didn't have before 2016. Um, and it was really important because following the 2016 election, the Department of Homeland Security reported that all 50 state election systems were scanned by the Russians. Um, two systems were actually uh, did uh, were penetrated, and uh, this just really raised the profile of cybersecurity in the election sphere. So Congress, in uh, it, really to their credit, allocated almost 800 or over 800 million dollars to states to beef up cybersecurity for. Um, oh, and this is a terrible typo. That should be 20, not 200 million. Um, Congress allocated 800 million dollars to states for cybersecurity for the ramp up to the 2020 election and Washington state actually received $20 million of that money. And this was really critical in our, our ability to ramp up and to really put a fine point on why this is significant. When uh, the Russians attacked, and it's now well known, uh, the uh, Illinois state election system, and a lot of um, a lot of research has gone into that, that attack. And what they learned from that attack um, and it's chronicled here in an NPR story, but um, in 2016, Russia was hitting the Illinois state election system five times per second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this is the level of attack that we are now facing across the country in the election sphere every single day. So imagine this, a foreign national government is hitting you know, county election offices five times a second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the, the resources that, that um, Congress provided us and that designation of critical infrastructure allowed our state to be able to partner with the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, and also some of our local partners like the Washington National Guard. And this also was a game changer. So um, we were able to um, take a step back as we were finalizing the vote law system and because we'd had this infusion of money from the federal government, we were able to build the first in the country election cybersecurity unit. And what was really powerful about this is by working through the Vote Law Project, we knew that bigger counties like King and Spokane and uh, Pierce County had really good resources. They had IT systems and, and support in their um, election divisions. But the medium and smaller size counties were lucky to have IT people in their county, let alone in their uh, election offices. So we created this center to really support all of the 39 counties in their election sphere. And so we were able to put our firewalls and our monitoring software and systems around the vote law system here at the state and all 39 county um, offices as well. 
And it also allowed us to um, not only protect and monitor, but test those systems and have um, external groups like Department of Homeland Security, like the Washington National Guard, try to uh, try to go in and be white hat hackers and try to, to uh, get into our system and find out if we had any vulnerabilities. And probably the, the most significant thing that came out of this work was what we call continuity of operation plans or COOP plans. And so our office put a focus on developing our own continuity of operation plan, but we also worked with the counties to help them develop their continuity of operation plans. And it really was with this idea of cybersecurity. And uh, we did things like tabletop exercises, which is what is in this picture on this slide, where you bring in county um, election officials in a room and uh, you start throwing scenarios at them. It's seven o'clock in the morning on election day and we just had a 6.8 magnitude earthquake. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do if your um, election system is hacked and they ha now have ransomware holding it hostage? And so it, it forced us all to think about worst case scenarios, which really helped us be prepared in 2020 for the cybersecurity attacks that we saw. So that was all on the cyber front, but make no mistake, county election officials and state election officials in our state have been thinking about security for decades. So cybersecurity is not new to us, just the level of, of what we can do and monitor is, is really greatly increased. But know that there are also multiple layers of physical, physical security for every element of the election process from the moment we start laying out a ballot to the moment we certify the election. And um, you know this, this happens on multiple levels from uh, ballot drop boxes, those are secured, they're only open during the voting period, 18 days before election day. They're closed simultaneously statewide on at eight o'clock on election night uh, when they're picked up by, secure, by election personnel. It's uh, in a dual control environment where you have two people, they're counting and logging those ballots. When they arrive at the election office, Office. They're counted physically and uh, throughout the whole process reconciled daily to make sure that every single ballot is accounted for, but also um, each return ballot signature on that outer envelope is checked against the voter registration system uh, signature that's on that original voter registration record. And um, these, these layers of security really um, dovetail nicely into each other. So the phys physical security of our election offices, um, there are security cameras, there are locks, everything in the environment has um, seal logs and and uh, we can track and, and identify who's had access to any group or individual ballot from the moment we receive it to the moment we certify the election. So the end result is 2020 in Washington state, contrary to some of the reports on social media and in the news, was one of the most secure elections. It was the most secure election that, that I've overseen and been part of in my 29 years doing this work. Uh, we had over 6,800 candidates file for office on our vote was system. We had the highest turnout in state history for the presidential primary. And re remember that that happened um, the Tuesday after we went into statewide lockdown for COVID back in March. So it, we were actually tracking for 60% turnout. So COVID did have an adverse effect, but we still had high engagement and involvement. Um, we had a uh, great turnout for uh, the primary. It was the highest turnout uh, record in over 50 years. And uh, in the general election, we had the highest total number of ballots cast, even though we fell a little bit shy of the, the 2008 number by percentage it was the highest turnout and volume in our state's history. And I think the most important thing to remember, even with all of the, the lawsuits and all of the posturing that, that candidates have had, the day after the election, nationwide, election officials weren't the story. Um, you weren't hearing about long lines. You weren't hearing about voters who didn't get their ballots. You were hearing about election officials trying to uh, process a record turnout election and trying to uh, make sure that they uh, did a, you know, reported all those results accurately. Finally, one of the things I'm very proud of is, is that Washington was indeed a leader um, in 2020, and we were able to help all 50 states um, ramp up their expanded absentee ballots and vote by mail election. And uh, this was really um, 
I guess, solidified by a couple of reports. One was from the Brookings Institute, where they rated all 50 states on how they conducted and their ability to conduct the um, 2020 election. And we received a perfect score. I uh, believe the only perfect score, not that I'm competitive or anything, uh, but also uh, the Election Law Journal recently ranked Washington State number two in ease of voting. We were behind Colorado. We are always behind Colorado, so we're going to work on that. Finally, I know many of you on this call are data people and would like to know much more about the data and some of the things I talked about um, on, a, on a deeper level. So you can go to the Secretary of State's webpage and find the 2020 annual report of our uh, elections this last year. And it does a deep dive in turnout in um, the effects and the impacts of the, the new legislation and the democracy, access democracy laws and, uh, and really the impact they had on the election. And and um, you can reach that at uh, the election uh, website below. And that is all I have. So I'm going to now turn it back over ah, to you. <laughs> all right. Well, great. That's terrific. I, you know, one of the, I, if there's a bright lining in 2016 and 2020 elections, it's, it's that a topic um, that normally is considered dry and not very interesting has all of a sudden become very interesting. And a lot of people are paying attention to it. So it's really interesting to hear the things that you and others have been doing to uh, address questions of election security. Let me begin, I have lots of questions. Uh, let me begin with a question um, about mail-in balloting and absentee balloting. That seemed to be a central focus of a lot of the concern in 2020. Uh, and there's concerns on both the left and the right here. Uh, on the right, of course, it's uh, been about, um, about fraud, the potential for fraud and mail-in balloting. On the left, there's questions about access um, mm -hmm. and, and mail-in balloting. So, so is it, given these concerns uh, and given the, the fact that states had very different processes for absentee balloting and mail-in balloting over this last election, do you think there's a need for national uh, legislation to set some standards for uh, ballot access and mail-in balloting? The concept is a really great one. Uh, the challenge is how do you do that in, in this partisanly charged and politically divided uh, environment that we find ourselves in? Um, you know, I've. I've been doing elections since the National Voter Registration Act was passed by Congress in 1993, and anytime you start talking about changing things at the federal level, even if they're just standards, um, let alone putting into law at the federal level, uh, election law, is you you kind of stop it in time. And uh, we've seen that in, in some of the big pieces of federal legislation, like the Help America Vote Act, um, like the MOVE Act, that you know, even National Voter Registration Act, when they were passed in law, it was cutting edge. You know, so in 1993, it was cutting edge to use the national change of address form to update voter registrations. Okay, that was before the internet existed. And so now election officials are stuck mailing things to students who move very frequently during uh, their time in college, for example, and trying to keep up with them with a system that's antiquated and that many of them don't use very frequently. So my, my concern with any kind of national standards is, Who's going to set them? Who's going to enforce them? And um, and you know how do we get away from the partisanship that that tends to follow that? Um, there are two you know co congressional laws or bills being um, worked right now in the House and the Senate S one and R and H one uh, HR one HR one. And, um, and these do, quite frankly, would pretty much codify at the federal level what we already do here in Washington state. So from our perspective, it wouldn't be a real big change, but it would be a huge change for most of the states. And I think that um, the constitution is pretty clear that it's a state function and I tend to be a state's rights person. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we need to work together and, and find those standards and best practices and share them and try to help states move forward um, kind of voluntarily Early, but it's, it's a challenge. Okay. So I have a question from uh, Denny Johnston, who's actually there in Olympia with you, I, not with you, but in Olympia. Mm -hmm. uh, he said he, he's, it's very disconcerting that 78% of Republicans believe our election was fraught with fraud when responsible studies have shown the election fraud is very low and, and rarely occurs. So he asks, uh, how is election fraud defined and how do you explain why so many Republicans are misguided in their beliefs about the widespread nature of fraud in our elections? Well, says, thank you for your wonderful service to, uh, to the Washington and to the nation. 
Oh, thank you. I appreciate that, Denny, very, very much. Um, so the true definition of voter fraud, if we, if we want to look at it in its purest sense and how the courts look at it, voter fraud is some activity that is designed to change the outcome of an election. And that could be, um, you know, manufacturing voter registration forms and getting ballots and and turning them in to try to, to stack an election in a certain way or, you know, effectively stuffing the ballot box or um, somehow manipulating the results electronically in a ballot tabulation system to uh, change the results. And so, um, and make no mistake, our country has a rich history that goes back uh, over the last century. Uh, and there's many famous cases on both the left and the right of of, um, of incidents of voter fraud. Uh, um, LBJ, uh, Lyndon Johnson, for example, they found an entire box of, of ballots magically that helped him win, I think, his first, um, I don't know if it was a Senate race, I can't remember, but it's a very famous box of ballots. And I think um, when you look at the last 50 years, that's what election officials have spent a lot of time doing, is trying to build in the controls that if someone makes a claim of voter fraud, that we can disprove it or we can show that it did happen and have an election uh, overturned in the courts. Um, so true voter fraud is the intent to change the outcome of an election by some means. Now, with that said, um, it's a very heavy lift. I'm not saying it can't happen. I always like to uh, liken voter fraud to bank fraud. So, you know, can you walk into a bank right now? Well. Now with COVID, I guess you can't, but could you walk into a bank before COVID with a gun and put it in the teller's face and walk out with a bag full of cash? Yeah, you can. And then you're probably going to get caught by the FBI because there's a whole bunch of controls to try to prevent that. And then a whole bunch of measures to catch you if you do that activity. And the election system is very similar. We have a lot of things to prevent fraud, like here in Washington state, for example, when you register to vote, you provide either your Washington state driver's license, your Washington state ID card, or the last four of your social security number. We actually verify those numbers against the Department of Licensing or the Social Security list. And 98% of our voters present one of those forms of ID. So I, I have a very high confidence level that the people on our rolls are actual people. But ultimately, if someone wanted to try to perpetrate fraud, they could. And then I'm also confident we would detect it and we could prosecute them for a uh, felony that they committed. Um, but I think where it's gotten muck, muddy in 2020 is... Um, really started five years ago uh, when President Trump was a candidate. You can go back and look at uh, news coverage and you can look at the tweets that he had during the primaries. And he was laying the foundation for losing. Uh, he was tweeting out things that, you know, the only explanation for me not getting through the primaries is a rigged election. And then he made it and became the nominee. Then he shifted that, that language to, oh, the only explanation for me not winning against Hillary Clinton is a rigged election. And then he won. And, and I've heard, read recent reports where um, they had created the Stop the Steal campaign back when he was still a candidate. So now you, you fast forward to going into the 2020 election and the same rhetoric started. Uh, the president was tweeting the same types of things. And then as we got into the middle of 2020, it ramped up to a new level. Um, he started taking a swing at uh, vote by mail elections. And I found myself <laughs> getting national reporters calling me, asking me what I thought of the latest tweet by the president. That was pleasant, um, you know, and of course, being a Republican, that uh, they, they were very interested in hearing my point of view. And so, you know, I, as an election official, first and foremost, regardless of my party affiliation, my job is to inspire confidence in the entire electorate, not just my party. So I always try to take a very balanced approach and I just combated whatever the president and then later the attorney general said with the facts and how we conduct elections here in Washington state. And, um, and my colleagues across the country were doing very similar things. And the challenge for them was they were spinning up these systems. So realize in, in um, probably March of 2020, 26 states were used to seeing 5% of their ballots cast by mail. And those states had to spin up the opportunity for you know, anywhere from half to all of their voters to vote by mail. We had a decade to do that here in Washington. So, um, so it was really trying to, I think, I think the president's intent was to try to, to um, weaken confidence in those systems that were being built. And it's unfortunate because he was effective in doing that with his own base. 
And um, ironically, I think it really kind of suppressed a lot of the Republican votes that were cast on election day because so many people didn't want to use an absentee ballot or a mail-in ballot uh, as Republican voters, and they waited till election day to vote. And I think in some cases that could have backfired because those voters didn't necessarily make it to election to the election day voting circumstance. I don't have data for that, but it's a, an assumption I'm making. So anyway, long story short is that environment has um, really cast out on it. And then of course it's self-fulfilling prophecy. He didn't win the national popular vote nor the electoral college vote. And so by now he's laid the foundation that the only explanation could be rampant fraud. And then of course, as was earlier mentioned, 60 lawsuits were filed um, after election day and all of them have been thrown out by the courts including the US Supreme Court yesterday. So um, I think that's a vindication of the system working but um, it's been painful and unfortunately we've lost a lot of voter confidence um, in the process. Okay, so one of our viewers, uh, as long as we're on sort of the politics of this, mm -hmm. uh, Griffin Grubb asks about the uh, lawsuit filed by uh, uh, Mr. Culp uh, mm -hmm. in the gubernatorial campaign. What are your thoughts about the attack on the integrity of the election and security process here in the state of Washington? Oh, you know, it's, it's the same playbook um, that, you know, uh, Lauren Culp used the same playbook that President Trump did and started very early, right after election day, within a few days. Um, again, the only explanation for my loss is this rampant fraud. And um, it's disheartening. The, the challenge in December for us was um, they had filed a lawsuit. So we really couldn't talk about any of the measures we had put in place because of the pending litigation. And, um, and a lot of the information that, that was being shared on Facebook live events and, and social media um, not only wasn't factual, some of it was out and out falsehoods and um, really trying to confuse voters, I think, and really trying to, um, to undermine the credibility of the system because that, that was the only way he had a path to victory. And so um, we were kind of, we had our hands tied and that's why we went for the sanctions, quite honestly, is that the, the level of information that's being shared in this lawsuit is beyond the pale. It is not only factually incorrect, it is actually a lie. And, um, and so we're willing to prove that in court. We are ready to prove it in court. And we feel so strongly, we think you should have as much skin in the game as the state of Washington has. And, uh, and you know, that if, that if it's proved in court, you're wrong, that uh, you're gonna have to pay the legal fees back to the state. Um, and they immediately back down. Um, the rhetoric I think continues. Um, it's, been, it's been frustrating. I had to get a new phone number because on one of those calls, um, the CULP campaign put my personal cell phone number out on on Facebook and uh, that was fun, um, uh, you know, and, and certainly been a lot of personal attacks, um, which, you know, the nice thing for me is my mom gave me great advice when I was, I think, 17 or 18 that, you know, just because the kids at school say you have blue hair doesn't mean you do. And so there's there's been a lot of talk in re Republican rooms and uh, and I've seen them. I don't even look at social media anymore um, and and trying to attack my my credibility and, and trying to attack the credibility and the integrity of my colleagues. You know, um, I think our election system stands well on its own. I'm proud of what we've built. I can defend it and love to uh, and welcome it. And, you know, so now it's, it's trying to rebuild that confidence within the Republican Party um, because there have been multiple polls now that have, have definitely shown that 60 to 70 percent of the Republican Party believes that the election was stolen. So we'll work to that end. And I think transparency is the key. Um, the more that we can share with the public all of the security measures we put in place, all of the reconciliation that we do, all of the audits that we do, um, I think that's just going to inspire confidence on, on a um, hopefully a higher level and hopefully we, hopefully we can regain it. But uh, with that said, I know that half the state, what, 16 years later, still believes that uh, Dino Rossi was robbed of the election results. And um, you cannot convince that, that half of the state otherwise. And, uh, and that's what I worry about in the long term is that undermining voter confidence just really ultimate, ultimately undermines people's confidence that elected leaders are legitimate. Yeah, well, at least the, the Rossi race was a much closer race. So the, the sort mm -hmm. of out there was a little more uh, understandable. You know, and I have some other questions from uh, audience members about the politics side of this. Let me get back to some of the ballot security questions, though. Investigate West did a study they released last week that showed that uh, voters with Latino last names were about six times as likely to have their ballots rejected because of the signatures. 
And there's also some evidence to suggest that young people who are unaccustomed to writing in cursive uh, are more likely to have their ballots rejected as well. So how much of a problem do you think this is? And are there alternatives to using uh, signatures uh, to, to verify ballots uh, and make sure that they're actually cast by the people who indicate they are? Um, again, here in Washington, I, I'm very confident that our signature system is a really solid way of, of verifying a person's identity and that the voter the ballot was issued to is the one who returned that ballot. Um, and I say that because we, we actually spend a lot of time double checking uh, rejection rates after an election to see if we're seeing any trends or any anomalies. Um, what, the, what the data show over the last 20 years is primary elections have a slightly higher rejection rate, about 1.6, 1.8% of the total ballots that are returned. And general elections, it drops below 1% to about 1 point, or point, uh, 6 to 0.8%. And so, you know, of course we want every, every ballot to be counted and we want them all to be legitimate and it's that balance of access and security. Um, so this, this research that's being done on the, the uh, his, Hispanic and Latino surnames certainly has got our interest. Um, and uh, we wanna do a deeper dive into the data. In fact, one of the things I'm thinking very seriously about doing for multiple reasons is uh, seeing if we can engage the Washington State Patrol to do a, a random audit of signature verification from the 2020 election. And uh, this is a rough idea. I'm just putting this out publicly. I probably shouldn't, but I will. Um, I went to Georgia to, um, to give support to my colleague in Georgia during their runoff election. And they had done that in a county. They had their, uh, their what's the equivalent of the FBI in Georgia do a signature um, random sample and, and they had their signature experts, these are people that do fraud investigations, look through the signatures and out of the 15,000 signatures in this county that they looked at, they found two that the signature that was accepted did not match the signature on file. And it turns out that those two were instances where the spouse had signed, the wife had signed for the husband. Um, yeah, so um, I'm confident that our, our signature matching would have that same type of result, but I'm now kind of wanting to prove it because um, what, what the study showed in Washington is that 10 counties in Washington have a higher incidence of rejecting uh, Latino and Hispanic sounding names and um, or surnames. And so um, we would like to kind of look at that because I think that data shows one thing and let's see if it is a bias or let's see if, if maybe there are other factors that maybe those communities that there's something we can be doing better that would help a higher success rate and have them be on the same, same level as their um, non-Latino um, peers. And uh, same thing with young voters is, you know, is there something that we're not doing in education? Is there something we're not doing in the way we present the information that, that is precluding them? Or is it, as you said, they're just not used to signing their names. But, I, but we're gonna try to do a deeper dive and maybe we could partner with the Foley Institute to do some of that. That work so okay. okay um let me ask you also about it uh, some legislation in olympia right now um representative uh, harris talley has uh, introduced a bill that would promote uh, ranked choice voting in local mm -hmm. elections uh is that something you favor what do you think about that kind of reform again you know the, the idea behind this is it would help uh alleviate some of the polarization that's taking place in our two-party system right now well, the thing I found for my 30 years almost in elections is the devil's in the details. And um, conceptually, there are lots of different ways that you can elect people from rank choice voting to instant runoff voting to top two primary. Um, and each of those systems have pros and cons. So I'm not really wedded to any one system. Um, you know, I obviously want Washington's to be the best. That, that's really the key. And so the bill that, that's before the legislature right now, um, we, my office has come out in opposition to it not because of ranked choice voting. We're in opposition for it because the bill really lacks the specificity first and foremost to be able to implement it. Um, it has some pretty wide open uh, language in terms of whether, um, how local jurisdictions could pick the system that they would use to elect their, their, um, their offices. For example, the way the bill's written right now, you could have, and let's take Spokane County just as an example. Spokane County this fall, if the law was enacted, you could have um, 
Uh, the city of Spokane could have the mayor's race by ranked choice voting. The, um, the school board could be using a slightly different version of ranked choice voting that had a primary election, and then everybody else would be elected by a top two model. And, and the concern I have there is one, just how do you manage that administratively and fairly and accurately, but how do you explain to the voter in the city of Spokane, who now has three different types of ballots, how do you explain the instructions? How do you do that? So even if you could get through all of that, let's pretend we could, could clean that all up. The next level is the cost. Um, the, the, uh, one of the voting systems, there are four different vendors that have voting systems in our state, clear ballot. The, the, they have two thirds, I think, of our, our Washington voters, um, are, their ballots are counted on a clear ballot system. Clear ballot yesterday notified um, Pierce County that they can't even estimate the cost it would take to convert their system to be able to tabulate ballots like this, so they can't do it. And it would cost additional amounts of money. And, um, I think the biggest problem I have with ranked choice voting is, um, and let's go back to, to the Rossi Gregoire scenario, that was a system everybody understood. Everybody understood how the ballots were counted and to this day, half the state doesn't believe the results. Now imagine a system where you have layers and, and different rounds of voting and everything and the counting is done by an algorithm in a computer. And remember, we have Lauren Culp supporters that right now believe that that, that election was stolen because of computer coding that, that was magically put in our, our tabulation systems that it wasn't, by the way. And we have paper ballots, we can go back and hand count. Um, so, so it's the multiple layers. And I don't, I don't wanna be Debbie Downer, but, but it does matter because what we're seeing in states that rolled out very good systems for absentee ballots and, and uh, expanded uh, vote by mail voting, it's being called into question because of just a change. So, so it, these are real things. Now I'm completely open to it. And I, th I think that, that uh, the bill as written right now needs a lot of work before it's something that we could actually do, but, um, but we have some pretty serious concerns about the bill as written right now. Okay. So uh, Ali Figlin asks, a uh, Figlin asks a question about uh, efforts by state legislatures. Many of these are Republican uh, state legislatures right now that are aiming at making it more difficult uh, to vote, uh, limit, restricting ballot access. Um, now, of course, these legislatures pass these bills uh, in the name of ballot security or election security oftentimes. So, so I guess the real question is, you know, how do you feel about these measures is what her, her question is, but how should we balance off the qu question about access versus security and, and how should uh, the general public think about that balance? Oh, it's, you know, it, that's the, the constant struggle. And, and remember, election laws are made by politicos who are elected by them. And so usually people that are um, sitting in elected office in a legislature, for example, excuse me, both parties, doesn't matter, uh, Democrats or Republicans, they kind of like the way the system works right now, because obviously it's good because they got elected by it. Um, and I say that in jest, but remember, everyone who's writing election laws is looking through that prism if they're elected. And so you can't take the partisanship out of election administration and election laws because of that, that nexus. And, um, and certainly when either political party gets in power, they are going to leverage that. And typically on the left, it's about voter access. On the right, it's about voter security um, or voter preventing voter fraud. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's uh, hopefully we have people like me who, who talk about it in tandem. And so um, one of the things I'm concerned about is, is they're trying to roll back a lot of these advances that we got, got to in 2020, expanding absentee balloting. You know, we have states like South Carolina where not only do you have to have an excuse to get an absentee ballot, it's only a list of four or five things that can validate as an excuse and you have to prove it. In the modern era, that's absurd. Um, I shouldn't have said that publicly, but whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that you go to models like Washington State and Colorado and Oregon who've been doing vote by mail elections a long time and you build in those security measures and it's how you roll them out. Um, we've had voter ID in Washington State since 2008. No, 2006. And we rolled it out well. We've withstood a Brennan Center challenge, as a matter of fact. I'm really proud of that. And, and you know, so if you're going to talk about having, you know, I think the big thing for most Republicans and what I've heard in our state is we don't do a citizenship check. Yeah, we don't because of federal law for a lot of reasons. But if you want to 
have that be part of the process, then make access to real IDs like an enhanced driver's license easier. If that's a barrier for low-income people, for example, then reduce the fee. <laughs> and, and then now you have a citizenship check separate from voter registration, separate from elections. You have a higher confidence level that the people that are registering with their enhanced driver's license are meeting all the criteria for voting because you can verify the other parts. And now everybody can have more confidence and we have to be talking about things that way. Um, but ultimately it's, it's getting over partisanship. And I think that one of the biggest threats to our election system right now is partisanship. Um, all of that misinformation that came from domestic actors is because of partisan gain or loss. And, um, and ultimately public confidence is suffering and it's a problem. I don't know that I answered the question, but it's what we got to keep working on. Okay, so uh, probably have one la time for one last question, uh, and it's going to be about pure politics. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, That's fine. Bring it on. <laughs> so, so um, you know, even after the uh, the violence on January sixth, uh, a majority in the uh, of the Republicans in the House and seven senators, Republican senators in the Senate, uh, still uh, contested the election results. Um, now you're one of the, uh, you're the only statewide elected Republican in the state of Washington. And there's a, clearly a huge division in the, in the Republican party right now between sort of that populist Trumpian cult wing on the one side and the more mainstream moderate wing led by people like Mitch McConnell at the national level and people, I, I suppose, like you here in the state of Washington. Uh, how do you see that divide playing itself out? Uh, over the next four years, both at the national level and here in the state? Oh, it's, it's going to define the future of the Republican Party. I'm, I'm convinced. I think that right now, in this point in history, we are exactly where the Republican Party was when I was, quite frankly, born um, in 19, around 1964. Um, you had the same thing. You had the John Birch Society, which was a very conservative wing of the Republican Party, trying to take over and really um, forcing that, you know, what kind of Republican are you discussion. And, and what we saw in 1964 is, um, moderate and mainstream Republicans, I guess you could call them, uh, like Slade Gordon and Dan Evans and Lud Kramer, who were elected that year and bucked the, the, you know, the tide, if you will, and stepped up and said, no, that's not what our party's about. And they stood up to that radical right wing of the party and, um, and said, this is what our party is going to be about. And I think you saw it in to a lesser degree in 1980 when Ronald Reagan came to power. It's why I'm a Republican to this day. I, I would define myself as a Reagan Republican um, because he inspired me. I was just entering college and, and what he said made sense to me. And, and he was able to, to get back to that big tent philosophy. Now, 20, you know, 40 years later, that big tent philosophy is um, uh, absolutely the bane of, of the existence of the, the folks on the hard right. Um, I certainly have been called some really interesting things in the last um, uh, couple of months. I'm apparently a rhino, a Republican in name only. I'm apparently part of the deep state. And there are some folks in the party that think I'm a Democrat. And so I find that interesting um, because I've been an elected official for 20 years now in the state as a Republican. And quite frankly, it'd be way easier to be a Democrat. But it's neither here nor there. I mean, um, I I think that this will define the Republican Party nationally and in our state. And um, either you're going to see a, a division, which um, will, of course, just embolden the Democratic Party in, in ways to uh, to maintain power, because uh, then you just weaken the Republican Party. But I think I, I will say this is stuff I've been dealing with for over 20 years, um, the same, you know, conservative versus moderate wing of the party. And I think the Democratic Party is starting to have the same kind of uh, pushback and, and wrestling for what the soul of the Democratic Party is between the progressive wing and the more moderate wing. So I think that that both parties are going through it. I think it's it's a different uh, experience because we've had more experience doing that in the Republican Party. Um, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to work through and find what what Reagan talked about the 80% we can agree on and the 20% we don't, we just accept that we don't. Um, and uh, we're going to see, I, I can't tell though. It's too early to tell. So, so I lied. I have one last question. Okay. So, so I know you spent some time with, uh, with uh, secretary Raffensperger down in, in uh, Georgia when he was under so much pressure by the president, by uh, others um, uh, to, to, 
to find votes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and he was threatened and, and his uh, local uh, election officials were threatened uh, with violence and, and physically. I know that you've also had some threats and uh, some of your staff uh, in the state of Washington. And, and um, you know, as a, an exemplary public servant, you know, someone who's clearly been committed all your life uh, to, um, to serving the public the best you can, I, I just want you to, to, um, to tell us how you feel about that and, uh, and how we, we can all uh, address that problem in our politics. You got me. Um, it's tough. It's tough. Um, I've been, like I said, been doing this work almost 30 years, never seen it level to this level. And, and I lived through as a county election official, the Rossi Gregoire election. I actually had a guy follow me home in my car um, and he just had a question. He wasn't trying to threaten me. He was just really overzealous, but um, it was, it freaked me out then. Um, yeah, this is a, a different level. It's obviously upsetting because it's, it's my friends. It's colleagues that I know having have great integrity are doing the work to the best of their abilities and they're doing it well. Um, so it, so it's unnerving because I've never I've never seen this level of frustration and anger leveled at election officials. Um, quite frankly, over made up stories. Um, but it's real. And uh, there's a bill in the legislature to try to increase the, um, uh, you know, the penalties for those threats. I think that, um, you know, what, what, what's, what made me go to Georgia was um, just, I was so angry. Uh, it was right around um, between, it was right before Christmas. And I was just, I was frustrated that my colleague was under such scrutiny and under fire when he had just run this incredible election and, uh, and that Georgia had done such a great job and thank God had had paper ballots and, you know, all of it stood up, their recounts stood up, their, their signature verification stood up. And so when I got there, he, yeah, he had 24 seven protection. Um, I, I have a couple of colleagues in other states. Um, one colleague that um, she was in the backyard with her kids and a um, couple of rounds of ammunition hit trees in her backyard. You know, it, it's, it's to a level where people need to just take a deep breath and take a step back and let's, let's work through what the issues are. Um, but uh, it, it worries me because I think it's going to make really good people, um, really good people who are in, in this profession, leave it. And, you know, there's a point where losing your life over the outcome of an election isn't worth it anymore. And, uh, but I, I, I know of at least five secretaries of state that are under 24 seven protection by their state patrol. And uh, I hope we get past this because it's, it's, um, it's not a good healthy way for democracy to move forward. Okay, well, I didn't, I didn't mean to, to uh, <laughs> make you emotional, but uh, I, I, and I want you to know that so many of us, uh, the vast majority of us, uh, so appreciate what good public servants like you do to act with integrity and courage in times like these. And you care enough about our democracy to do so is, is huge. So accept our thanks. I appreciate uh, before, it. <laughs> be, before I, I thank you for uh, your presentation and discussion today, let me remind everybody that um, our next distinguished lecture in our series on the crisis in American constitutional democracy is this Thursday. That's with Bruce Ackerman, who's the Sterling Professor of Law at Yale. Uh, so please join us for that. And now uh, I hope you all will join uh, with me to thank Kim Wyman today for a really interesting conversation. Uh, Kim, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. And, and thank you. We'll see you all hopefully on Thursday.